Well, today I have the blessing of being here with Reverend Robin T. Jennings. I am so excited to have a conversation with him. He is a clergyman, author, speaker who helps believers face the needs of today through spiritual growth and relying on biblical wisdom. And uh, he's also passionate about mentorship and equipping the next generation, which you know gives us, I don't know, hours worth of things to talk about. So uh, (laughs) Reverend Jennings, thank you for being here today. Oh, thank you, Courtney. It's it's obviously a, my pleasure and honor. Absolutely. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? A little bit. <laughs> we did say, okay. he goes, you know, I'm a pastor. You know, I can just like keep talking, right? <laughs> well, and, and you know, I'm mature. I'm old. So uh, <laughs> this is a way of saying I could go back a long, long time ago in a place far, far away. You know, one of those kind of, but I think the, the, um, for your listeners, uh, yes, I grew up in the Episcopal Church, mm-hmm. and that uh, came with a sense of affiliation to a denomination mm. and to the people and the minister, great guy, all these kinds of things. And friends of mine were there, but <laughs> it was pretty external. And oh. if you're familiar with anything like an Episcopal church or Catholic, it's, it's all about the liturgy, the sacraments. It is external in so many respects. There's a prayer book. Um, so, you know, just prior to our going on to this interview, you said, let us pray. Uh, if you asked me 60, 70 years, 60 years ago, I'd say what page, you know, it would be that kind of thing. Are you following me? Okay. So it wasn't spontaneous prayer. And, and it was again, um, more well liturgical in terms of its understanding of, of worship and the way in which we went Sunday in and Sunday out very, uh, dedicated in that respect through the week, (laughs) Courtney, (laughs) I was a boy, (laughs) I was a goof off. I was a kid, you know, so (laughs) (laughs) I won't go into great detail, but let me just say it continued all the way through high school. I Mm. uh, I had a lot of fun and uh, sports, uh, baseball, football, basketball, Mm -hmm. uh, wrestling, wrestling. (laughs) You name it. I'm a boy mom. I have two boys, so I know all about that. That's why I've heard that. I've seen that, and that's why I'm telling you all this. So get get ready. Oh boy. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm not saying there wasn't a religious. gene in me or impulse or anything of that sort i i would have considered myself faithful um but here we go it wasn't until i really got into college and there met this young lady which does it every time that's right that's right and by the way it's my wife now so i can talk about her (laughs) but love um it really does change things. And, you know, suddenly you take uh, interest in people, care for people, don't want to hurt people. Um, it's an understanding of love that um, as a as a competitive, stupid boy <laughs> growing up <laughs> who yeah. just played sports, you know, and didn't like girls and all that kind of thing, all of a sudden you're going, whoa, this is a whole new game, you know? Mm-hmm. So, how much farther do you want me to go in my life? Because <laughs> so, how many years have you been married? Almost fifty. Come this July, you're going to hear it loud and clear. Yeah, <laughs> and we've got kids and grandkids, and um, you know, in fact, talking with you, it's like talking to my daughter-in-law. You know, the mm-hmm. same g- group of of young people, and and I and with all this said, um, it really is a celebration and a time for us uh, to um, really give thanks to God for. The gift of family mm-hmm. and what that's meant to us over the years. Yeah. Now, at some point in time, I mean, you, you mentioned your wife, but at some point in time, yes. you decided, okay, we're going to get serious about this church thing because you're a reverend. So, yes, I am. <laughs> at what point did that, like, that call or that, um, you know, that direction start taking place in your life? Well, that too. Um, it, every time we have one of these, as we continue with these, this conversation, I will br- keep bringing my wife into it because she was the religious one, Courtney, ah, okay. the spiritual one. She was a Presbyterian and she was young life. If you're familiar with that, yes. Billy Graham. I mean, she was, she was a Southern girl too, by the way. I was a okay. Yankee. I was okay. a Yankee. 
she didn't want to get near Yankees. You Where'd know? you come well, from? Uh, Chicago. Chicago. Oh my which, gosh. Chicago which, to the South. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where we met in school and all. And where, where okay. this is taking me is I went back to Chicago after college. We were madly in love and all those kinds of things, but not quite at the point of getting married mm. and um, not yet engaged. Um, but I did go back to Chicago. She stayed in Lexington, Kentucky, where she taught. I was in Chicago and it was a, it was before the days of email. <laughs> in other <laughs> yeah. words, we were writing love letters <laughs> uh -huh. every three days you get, well, where I'm going with all this is I was up in Chicago working in an Episcopal boys home. And I really thought I probably would go into like social work or psychology or something. I wasn't mm -hmm. clear where I, I was. I didn't know who I was, where I was, what I was going to do when I grew up, you know, one of those kind of things. Um, but it was Chicago during the late sixties, which was a great time of unrest. Mm -hmm. The Chicago police riots, the Democratic Convention, uh, Martin yeah. Luther King's assassination, Vietnam. I mean, no different in many respects from today. Just mm. very turbulent. Yeah. But I was, a. how do I want to say this? Well, I'll say it. I was a little white kid from the suburbs working in this uh, boys home where the kids were all classified as emotionally disturbed. Mm. And I had the seventh and eighth grade boys. And if you're almost, you're not quite at the point of seventh and eighth grade boys, but they're big. They're young the, men. They're big. And I feel like uh, just a, a normal seventh and eighth grade boy has issues they're working through. So if they Absolutely. are, <laughs> well, then this you is throw an extra in, hard population you're working you with. You look at their files and even though they were classified emotionally disturbed, which was an early on classification, I mean, who wouldn't be, you know, at this, mm -hmm. from what they experienced in their yeah. life point being every day there was a fight in mm -hmm. physical i mean you know throwing fist and and either i was breaking up caught in the middle of it or they were swinging at me wow um, yeah it was a, a angry con conflict uh time that was brand new to me but it, mm. it it in a sense almost broke me there was an episcopal chaplain there that i did turn to at times and uh, mainly because he was a good guy, uh, a little bit older than myself. We actually, I don't know if I can say this on air, but we would drink a little beer every now and then. And That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> kick back. I wasn't ordained, remember, by then. So, <laughs> but with that said, um, at one point he said to me, you know, you ask a lot of questions. Hmm. And he said, have you ever thought of seminary? Courtney. Yeah. <laughs> That's Had you that at was that my point reaction. Time? That was my reaction. No. <laughs> it was silence. I was uh, what? <laughs> huh? Come so again. immediately I, I called my wife and I said, sweetie, <laughs> have you ever thought of going to seminary? And she said, well, you know, I thought we might go to church. <laughs> <laughs> there's a couple steps I mean, above the, but yeah. yeah well the bar was pretty low with me and as where i'm where i told you you know but oh my god we went and i'll be honest with you everyone talked us out of it from the mm. administrative bishops dean of admissions chaplains there at the seminary mainly because um we were young mm -hmm. uh, it was uh admission would start in august or late august or early september uh we were going to get married in july and uh, they said, you know, take some time with marriage, get to know your, each other, you know, and good, good advice. But have you ever told a young person to wait? <laughs> <laughs> it's like probably like telling my four-year-old to wait. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's yeah. It. So there we went, there we went. Yeah. And, and, but the interesting thing is it was, it was good for us because our marriage was really built around the church and around our faith. Yeah. And so there you go. I mean, it worked uh, from that standpoint. I, I, I was young and restless and all that kind of stuff. Every week I was kicking the goads and wondering, as, as Paul would say, you know, really trying to get out of there. Did, was, did I belong there? Was I going to be a chaplain in a hospital? Did I really want to work in a mental hospital? Did I want to work in a church? You know, all these kinds of issues. And I was yeah. just struggling. Hmm. But at the same time, it was a, a process of discernment, which we can talk about. I mean, it was yeah. it was really very healthy and very good for me to grow up. Yeah. You mentioned the, the liturgy. I, I, I could have, I could have made the whole story. Oh, I'm sure right there. Just I, learn how to grow up. Yeah. You know, I'm actually doing recordings with my grandparents. Um, and the whole purpose is their life story. And yes. those are three hour recordings. <laughs> like we have to sure. stop okay, in the well, middle and go. take a snack break because you just have a lot of life experience to share. Oh my goodness. And yeah. we're going to talk about how important that is at the end or towards the second half of the conversation. But, uh, 
you mentioned something about the Episcopal Church. You, you mentioned the liturgy. And so I grew up yes. in the Baptist Church where, you know, it's a, it's a little more free. There's not, we don't sure. do the liturgy. And so I kind of saw the liturgy as, um, I'm going to say that my, my opinion has changed. So Go ahead, say it, know that. Uh, as kind of like <laughs> unauthentic, like just going yeah, through yeah. the motions that there's, yeah. there's no real dedication there. And, right. uh, it took one of my close friends who really loved liturgy to yes. come to me and say, no, 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 let me tell you about why I find the liturgy to be so beautiful. And I'm like, beautiful. That is not a word I would have, uh, <laughs> you know, subscribed to that. Uh, tell me. And it was very interesting to have that conversation with him um, and to understand where where it sure. fell for him. What have you discovered in like the liturgy and now being, you know, much older and having probably experienced other faiths, other denominations and other ways that they do it? What have you discovered about like the freedom of maybe some denominations and then the liturgy uh, structure of others. Yeah. Yeah. I need it. I need it all. And uh, you know, huh. I mean, I, it's um, kind of Heinz 57 variety is where I've ended up. Okay. And actually, I, because I teach now and, and I, I don't have a, the, the etiquette in the church is when you retire, you leave, don't let the door hit you kind of thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, but it's hard. And, and seriously, and that I'm, I'm in the same city, area where my church, the church was where I was for 35 years. So oh, wow. uh, I'll go to the grocery store and there they are, you know, parishioners. Have you heard yeah. this? Do you know that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to hear it. Yeah. But with that said, I teach, I teach at a large Methodist church. Um, oh, it's okay. interesting. Uh, when you said Baptist, um, we had a real strong partnership for years with a, a black Baptist church in Louisville. Okay. Okay. And oh my gosh, I would walk in there and, um, yeah, I, you know, I was once again, only the white guy, the only one there, but I was the preacher and I thought, here we go, what's going to happen. But as soon as I said the word Jesus, you know, the hands, hands were waving, up. the amens were there and boy, I got into it. I, you wouldn't have believed me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my, a couple of my kids would come periodically and hear me and they dad, I can't believe you sound like, you know, but oh, you get into gosh. the rhythm of it. You get into the spirit of it. It's just wonderful. And uh, right. then I'd come back to the Episcopal church and I'd say, wake up. <laughs> what are you, you know? <laughs> so it's oh, just, gosh. it's different. It's different. And each church and each denomination, I'm not knocking one or the other, as much as to say the Episcopal church, the liturgy in a sense provides that stability um, mm. and that comfort. So you can, um, begin to open yourself up inwardly because mm. outwardly it's taken care of when you go to some nom denominational churches outwardly you're thinking what are they going to say next what are they doing where did that song come from <laughs> who yeah. is that on the stage you know they've got tattoos you know all this kind of stuff where yes. you know what i'm getting at yeah so, i do i do and with I the love liturgy it. you can close your eyes <laughs> um, okay so, you're not going to miss yeah. anything <laughs> well, no, but you'll gain all that inner stuff that's going on mm, within you, you know, mm. which is a whole nother ball game. And we'll talk about that. Yeah. I, <laughs> you talked about like that, that inner kind of work. Um, what does, yeah. and one of the things that I see on your website and in some of your books, um, is this, uh, talk about spiritual growth and how you feel that is so important to those yes. that are in the church. And it's something that you're concerned that like uh, younger generations are missing. Uh, what does spiritual oh. growth actually mean today to you? Again, how much time do we have? <laughs> no, but it, it means, a, it means everything to me because mm. in, uh, in two reasons, why don't I start with the first, with your end of your question first, which was the young people, what they're yeah. missing they've got everything in their hand, in the palm yes. of their hand, in on their, their palm phones, of their, hand. On their right. phones. Mm -hmm. They've got whatever they, you know, I had to go to the library. <laughs> <laughs> they've got it right there. They, they, they can, they can Google it. You know, it's, yes, it's right true. there. Yep. Um, however, and this is where the, the, and it's not a generation gap, but it's, it's, it's the loss that is taken place is they've got, too much information, oh, really. I, yes, I agree. Uh, I agree. Overload, overload, overload. Mm -hmm. And also not necessarily the best of information. <laughs> and I won't go there right now because this is a 
Nice oh, show. people have heard me <laughs> preach about that. I've said okay, there's right, so right. much on the internet, and this is yeah. why we need discipleship because you need a place to go that's not full yeah. of junk. And when watch you, out you for your advice. kids. And watch out for your kids. Guard them. Yes. Protect them. Yeah. Oh, for okay. Sure. Yeah. So that's that story. That's that dimension. But with with that too, where I'm going with this is, and this sounds kind of slick, as a preacher would say, but but I am a preacher, so I'll say it. Is um, they've got a, so much information, but what's lacking is formation. Hmm. You catch okay, the so difference. Okay, so can can you yeah can you define yeah, that difference? Yeah, <laughs> I will. Yeah, formation is you're being formed. Um, or reformed around the spirit and around Jesus in your life. I, I often put it this way, uh, Courtney, is, um, and it, it was true in my life when I went through various changes from a life that was very self-centered to a life that has a centered self. And, you know, oh, wow. again, that preaches, that tell your dad that preaches. <laughs> oh yeah, that, that's that's every week we would joke with him. That'll okay. preach. That'll <laughs> is preach. He taking, is he taking notes? Yeah, <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm but, sure. <laughs> but seriously, um, it 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 really is a, a dimension, not more than a dimension. It's it's a way of life mm. that uh, opens us again to not only the spirit. When I say spirit, we're talking Holy Spirit, of course, but open because yeah. we can also talk spirits. But you know, th there is that understanding. But then following Jesus and being, again, uh, back to you, a disciple of Jesus, you know, mm -hmm. as, as you talk. Um, so what's the difference, um, you know, or, or I guess what is spiritual growth about and why do young people need it today? I think because um, there are so many. When I said dimension, I, I bit my lip almost because there are so many dimensions to our life. Yeah. You know, we're worried about our bodies, mm -hmm. our weight. <laughs> Yeah, our hair. I'm not worried about my, hair. <laughs> but you know, this is where, <laughs> but you know, this is the, okay. You're worried about, you know, the, there's that emotional dimension to life, the mm -hmm. intellectual side of life, the financial side of life. I mean, you know, you start going through all, for me, it was the athletic side. That's all that I cared about was the athletic mm -hmm. side of life. Well, you know, it's like all these spokes on a wheel kind of image that, that comes into mind. The hub the center um, comes our spirit, uh, mm. spiritual life. And, yeah. and if it's not there, or I almost said, it, if it ain't there, <laughs> um, we're out of balance. And yeah. uh, you know what that's like. And so that's in a gist uh, why I think the spiritual life is so important. It, it not only keeps us in balance, but it, then it's the spirit that feeds all these dimensions to our life. So spiritual growth, uh, growth in general comes out of uh, our Oof. our relationship with Christ. I guess I didn't touch growth, but let me speak to that for a second. Because here again, um, of this next generation, as well as all generations, I get everyone wants to grow. Mm -hmm. it sounds so good. I'm growing. <laughs> yes, um, that means yeah. I'm not dying. If I'm growing, yeah, then well, I'm not I dying. Do. So that's yeah, great. yeah. But you know, um, this is why I, I don't hate to say it, but what needs to be said is. Um, if growth requires change, are you ready to change? Mm. That's where the doors close and the end, conversation ends and the periods put at the end of the sentence and close the book, <laughs> you know, yeah. stick a fork in it, I'm done. Yeah. So, you know, it, it really is important to think of growth within the context of transformation and, and change, mm. which brings us, I think, to renewal or one of the uh, uh, thoughts that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, go ahead. You talk about spiritual growth, but then you also talk about spiritual renewal. So what's the difference between them? Well, again, spiritual growth, as I say, is a way of life. Yeah. I look at renewal as seasons of life mm. um, because you know what it's like uh, when you need renewal. Yeah. You're thirsty, you're dry, you're dark, you know, mm -hmm. something's wrong. I mean, there, there's a side of life that's not working. It's, um, I don't want to call it dysfunctional, but it's, 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 in a, it's not effective or whatever words, you know, might come up that where is God, yeah. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing in the absence of God or the, the I, he's, is he answering my prayer? I don't, you know, I'm, who am I, does he care about me? You know, you, mm -hmm. you start getting into that, that, so here comes call Dr. Renewal, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's where it's time, okay. not for a quick fix at all, but let's, 
and, and back again to you and our understanding of discipleship and, and mentoring here again, this is a cry for help. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when that phase of life or season of life occurs, because it is there, it will happen if it hasn't yet. Well, I think with spiritual growth, it sounds like um, maybe if you find yourself not really growing, um, maybe you've kind of come to a point of stagnation, uh, that yes. spiritual renewal is almost going to help restart that growth. Yeah. Yes. And I love even that idea that it's not, it's not one size fits all. Like most of, you know, religion isn't, uh, most for everyone, their relationship with Christ looks oh. a little different and yeah. we get a little dangerous when we say, this is what my relationship looks like. And yours needs to look the same as mine, or yeah. you are not saved. And yeah. Yeah. that can get, that's, that's called the Pharisees. Um, and Jesus didn't, didn't get along with the Pharisees, but I think that it's what you're saying. Yes. Makes a lot of sense that when we hit rock bottom or if we get to that point, that's when we're, uh -huh. we are more accepting to that change because sure. we know sure. that we need a change and that change can be something that we work out on our own. It can be, uh, going to our pastor. It can be attending church. It, it, yes. it could also be, uh, having our pastor partner us with a small group or, um, with a, you know, organization either in the community or in our church where he's like, yeah. I want you to meet these people and they're going to help build you up and they're going to help you get back to that point of growth, that type of thing. So here's, here's, here's to the small groups too. And the small group leaders. I mean, I think you can really, yeah. and I say this because, um, and I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but this is where God, you know, if you wonder if God has a sense of humor, tell him your plans <laughs> sort of yeah, thing. Yeah. Well, there was a phase that I went through. Um, shortly after becoming, it's what they call the rector, which is the, the head guy okay. uh, of the church. So I was big time. Okay. Thank you for explaining uh, that because Baptist girl over this, here this, needs yeah. help with the terminology. So. That's okay. But it was, it was like the chief pastor, you know, it was, it was a real, I was really important okay. uh, on paper. Okay. Courtney, <laughs> I'm trying to use my sense of humor here. I mean, I, I was, I was still, you know, inside and that's that's where i'm going with this inside i was hollow i mean mm. i looked the part i played the role i did what i was supposed to do i polished my shoes you know brushed my teeth i mean you know i'm sorry there was nothing inside i mean i mm. shouldn't say it quite like that but i was it was and i was not dead but i was not really alive either you know but i got into a program back in um when i was probably close to 30 mid 30s late 30s um so here we go, you know, yeah. and it wasn't quite what I wouldn't call it midlife, but it was, I was getting dangerously, dangerously close to, you know, going out and buying a Porsche and <laughs> no, but I didn't have the money, but um, <laughs> yeah. where I'm going with this, Courtney, is I went, got into a program of spiritual formation mm -hmm. uh, that was uh, out of Washington, D.C., and it was, uh, it, and we didn't have, we were just starting with computers and all, so there was some emailing and online stuff, but for the most part, mm -hmm. it was a correspondence kind of program, okay. but every quarter we'd go to DC. Then also we had small groups um, that were assigned to us in Kentucky. Well, Louisville, I was close to, and since you're not a Catholic, this may not mean anything to you, but the Abbey of Gethsemane, okay. as in Thomas, have you ever heard of Thomas Merton? No. Oh, Courtney. <laughs> I'll write, okay. it down. <laughs> write, I'll write it down. Write it down. Yeah. No, uh, but anyways, there, there's all these. Um, they're monks, Courtney. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going with. I this, have heard so. of some monks, but okay. not him. <laughs> but and they make cheese and you know fruitcake and uh, and really anyways, really yummy the, pastries in that's uh, right. <laughs> in Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you'd make a great spiritual person, Courtney. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> but with all this said, is. Um, one time I was in a group and in all seriousness, and I was, I was talking to a guy, oh, we were talking about surrender. Mm. And I said, mm. eh, it's, I can't do that. That's not a word for me. You know, let go, let God, everyone was telling me to let go, let God, you know, and it, and I guess that's a saying that people just thought was really good. And, and it is good, but I didn't get it, you know, and yeah. long story short, the guy I was with, one of the guys I was with was actually had been an Air Force pilot. 
Oh. And uh, and now ordained minister, and we because because we had mixed a uh, uh, group with different types of de denominations and ministers okay. in the group. Anyways, he said to me, he said, you know, I was like that too, Robin. And now I'm not being sexist here, Courtney, but he said, as boys <laughs> growing up, we were raised never to quit. Yeah, you don't surrender, you don't give up. You know, uh, quitters never win, winners never quit right? Mm -hmm. That's what mm -hmm. we were taught by our mothers. I don't know what you're teaching, but <laughs> well, well, <laughs> never mind. Courtney. But I was, I was a girl <laughs> raised with all boys and I felt the same thing of, <laughs> okay. I don't get to quit either because then I'm the yeah. only one quitting. So that's, well, not here's fun. where he took me where, here, where he took me, he says, well, you know, in the air force, we were also trained never to surrender to the enemy. In mm -hmm. fact, you'd rather shoot yourself That's right. than surrender to the enemy. Wow. I'm going, oh, that's pretty extreme, you know? Yeah. But he said, God is not the enemy. Ooh. You're surrendering to this. You're surrendering to the source of love. Mm. You can do it, Robin. Wow. There's the silence again. I mean, I just went dagger in the heart. I mean, you got me. And it, it, it was one of those conversations back to mentoring that, that, uh, it was a pivot, you know, I mean, I could just see my life change almost right before my eyes. I thought, I get it. It's real. Uh, There's someone that surrender. is like tearing up in there, like listening to this right now, because they're like, that's it. Jesus is not the enemy. If I surrender no. that, that, that is not showing weakness. No, because to surrender to the enemy means that you're being weak, but surrendering Love. to God does not show weakness. It shows yeah. strength to allow God to take my life completely. <laughs> hmm. wow wow i and listeners know i came to the same point but it took okay it took uh two people it took my husband telling me i needed to surrender me being really mad at him <laughs> poor guy <laughs> and then a friend confirming what he had told me not knowing what he had said to me and sure. she said you need to surrender and i was like i'm really mad at you right now because you just confirmed what my husband said and that means it wasn't him saying it. It was the Holy Spirit. And now I have to go home and apologize. <laughs> How great is that? <laughs> but <laughs> I'm but, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the same thing. It, it, there is something about culture, um, especially American culture, that says you can do this. You can do it all. Yeah. yeah. You can, and you, pull, you can do it on your own. Yeah. And and, yeah. and, there, and if there you're comes not going to pull yourself up by your pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you know all that Th kind of stuff. That's I right. Get, that's I, right. I get it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you're showing a struggle, uh, then that is weakness. And and what you're saying, surrender is weakness. I think um, yes, that is something that maybe was taught to young boys, but something that culture is saying to women right now is be a girl boss, like go out and and dominate and go out and and be strong. <laughs> And, yeah. you know, you're talking to women who can be strong, but yeah. for someone to say, but it's okay to cry, but it's okay to be weak. Sometimes yeah. it's okay yeah. to feel vulnerable, lost. vulnerable, vulnerable. Yeah, vulnerable. There's know? the word. Yes. It's okay to be that's vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that message is not being spoken. I think in, you know, culture as a whole. So this right here, this is like the perfect place to transition. You have a book called A Letter to the Church and the Next Generation, Spiritual Growth Through the Witness of James. So you Correct. use the message in James and you talk about mentorship because to me, that's one of the beautiful things about mentorship and discipleship is mm -hmm. that in a discipleship relationship, that may be the one place that you can be vulnerable mm -hmm. to the whole world. I understand if you're a CEO of a, a billion dollar company, you can't be vulnerable to the person that works at the front desk. Right. It, it, it's not going different, to different deal. Yeah. Yes. Entirely. But you need to have someone that you can be vulnerable to that. You can kind of uh, let your guard down and be brutally honest with this person so that they can be honest back so that they can say back, well, here's what, here's what I think maybe you want to think about. So I know that you really feel discipleship is important. One of the things yes. that I love about this book that you wrote is that at the end of the chapter, you have a chapter summary and then you actually have activities to yes. help 
um, a mentor to uh, kind of start that process of mentoring and uh, walk through one of the things you have is like a, hey, if you're just sitting down with someone, here's a commitment uh, that you're going to sit down and you're going to talk through, make all of these, how many times you're going to meet, what are you going to talk about, uh, how long are you going to meet, yes. and then you're both going to sign it. Not that it's like a, you know, blood contract. Contract. But, yeah. yeah, you're right. But <laughs> yeah. it is an agreement. Um, yes. And yes. I loved that. And then there's other things at the end of each chapter for us as disciplers to consider. So tell me why discipleship is so important. And I know that's something that could preach for like three hours. So know that when I ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> because I've taught for three hours on, I've taught for eight weeks straight on it. So I understand. Sure. <laughs> sure. Well, um, again, I'll start from uh, the standpoint of the Episcopal church mm. um, is that's not there. Uh, discipleship. I mean, evangelism is uh, um, oh, not an, it's not understood uh, mm. we don't necessarily go out oh by the way do you know the Episcopal Church is shrinking <laughs> so but okay. but uh, uh, where I'm saying all this and is, other churches as well because they well also, that too you know and, do not understand that no yeah. and that's it's not now I mean I think we put the brakes not not the whole Episcopal Church but this particular parish that I, uh, that I came out of and the, the the new generation that's taking over, it's really exciting to be able mm. to hand off and see it grow and take off like it is. But where I'm going with this, again, is from the standpoint of um, discipleship uh, or being a mentor, I almost, you know, here again, if you're a volunteer in the church, well, we'll let you count money. If you're a volunteer, you can uh, help with the flowers. If you're a volunteer, um, you know, you can, you can uh, be a reader, uh, you can be an usher. I mean, you know, there's the jobs like that that are around the Sunday morning worship, but connecting with the people. And, and yes, there's small groups and there's Bible studies. And there's been a lot that we've done that has opened up kind of the spirit of the church for Pete's sakes. But this idea of a mentor is something that goes deep, uh, more one-on-one -on -one, uh, with the mentor and the mentee, if you will, or the individual. Mm -hmm. And it's an opportunity in a way. Um, I used the word discernment earlier, and that's an yeah. important word. Um, and again, it's, it's, as I said earlier, about it being attentive and being aware of, of the person before you or that you're, you're working with. And I almost had to hesitate to say the working with, but you're in relationship with, because yeah. it's not necessarily a job, but you'll see in the, as you go through the book, one of the early chapters is on vocation. Mm -hmm. um, that comes from the Latin vocare, which means to call. Okay, now we're talking about your calling. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to really work with this age group that is in transition. That's um, after college, they're getting their first or second job. They've gone through COVID. My goodness, what that's yeah. done to these kids. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you said this could take hours or you've taught it for nine weeks. I've just started Courtney and yeah. I don't know where to, where, where I'm going and where to stop, <laughs> except to say uh, the, 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 de by developing mentors and a, a, a cadre of mentors, we can begin to reach some of these, these young people that are going through this transition that uh, for the most part are saying, thank God it's Friday. Mm-hmm. In other words, work is really a pain, but wait till we hit the party scene. Mm -hmm. And Sunday, church, it's not quite on the radar yet. Mm -hmm. By the way, the, the old, when I grew up, not when I grew up, but the sayings when I, that I had early on in the church was, you know, um, don't worry about that age group. When they get married, they'll come back to church. That's not happening Cor with millennials. Courtney, <laughs> Courtney. <laughs> you got it's that one. Happening. Yeah. All right. So there you go. That's strike one. Strike two, um, they go off to college. Oh, don't worry. When they go off to college, they'll come home. <laughs> well, they're coming home, but that's because they don't have a job. Well, where are you live? Where do you live? Oh, in Phoenix. Well, there you go. Of course they come back to Phoenix. Who wouldn't? <laughs> Except it's summer. 
you know, it's okay. Really but come back to Louisville, you know, it's, it's not that easy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so they'd rather go to Atlanta. They'd rather go to Nashville. They'd rather go to Washington, DC. You know, there are the a lot of people is. moving to Phoenix for sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But, the, but that's my point. It's not a demographic thing. Um, it's, it's who's before our eyes. And mm. once these young people, um, and there's some of them, my, my, my kids and their friends, you know, when you start to spot them, it's not in church. And um, what's, uh, and yet they've been raised in the youth group, they've been raised in the church, all this yep. kind of thing. And so to be able to plan um, a question of how are you doing? How's it going? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and to begin the conversation in a normal, natural, not artificial, but like you were saying earlier, honest, authentic way is really um, important, especially for a generation, remember, that is on their phone the whole time and doesn't. And I'm not going to say they don't have the social skills, but that's not necessarily something that they're would would you necessarily call a strength um, because they're not there yet. You know, they're yeah. still back in college or in high school and they're goof offs like yours truly and, you know, all that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. with all that said, um, it's a, a an important time for them to get to this initial uh, a question and consideration of vocation. Where do you think God's calling you? So I have so many directions we could go, but one thing okay. that I want to do before we go on is okay. I want to talk because you and I are both using the words mentorship and discipleship kind of uh, sure. interchangeably, in, interchangeably, uh, is there a difference between mentorship and discipleship in your opinion? Okay. <laughs> yes. But here's, here's where I'm going with this. Do you know okay. Dallas Willard, that name Dallas? I Willard? do. I do. Mm -hmm. Okay. His emphasis kind of split the two. He would talk about apprenticeship. Mm, do you remember okay. that? Yes. He yeah. was all into apprenticeship and being yep. an apprentice which I mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. understanding very much, except who not everyone knows if you're not a carpenter or an electrician or a plumber, you don't know what an apprenticeship is. Well, know. and as the so, trades are not no longer the focus yeah. as much, you know, it's more like, hey, you're going to go to college. But yeah. when you talk about the trades, that's where apprenticeship is of course, cr critical. Of course. You can't continue in the trades unless you No, done and an you catch his drift. You catch his drift. Yeah. And you know what, what he's saying. I mean, the guy was very important. He was a mentor in my life. Okay. Ah, so yes. with that, with that said, um, uh, this, this idea of a mentor kind of splits off from the, that standpoint, oftentimes discipleship is set, is set within the context of church mm -hmm. and, and, and sure Jesus, which is a good thing, you know, don't get me wrong, but, but there it is. And it's a, it's a package church program, you know, I mean, it's, it's a, where I'm going with this as far as being a mentor is sending these kids out into the world because they're already out into the world. Absolutely. But it's not, it's not loosey goosey. It's giving them a, a an anchor and a sense of calling. Um, many of them uh, would be more than willing to trade their job in now for working in a nonprofit or working in something that they, where they can get their hands dirty, where they can go on a mission. They're part of a, an age group that is into restoration. They want to restore the world. They want to turn the world green. And you know? they want to have a, they, they feel like there should be a bigger purpose to absolutely. their life. And so when they see their grandfather who's worked in a factory all yes. his life, they say, what, what, you know, what did you do for the world? What meaning did you have for the world? And yeah. we know that that's a, that's a generational difference in perspective. Yes. Uh, yes. you know, and he's like, what did I do? I provided for your parents and I, Jerk. you know, provided yeah. for our home. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We provided for our you? home. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and it's, but there's a difference in what is the purpose of life? Is it yeah. to make yeah. a big impact on this planet, which I understand because I'm a millennial and I feel that all the time. Uh, okay. Or is it, um, you know, to provide and to make sure that, that everyone is safe and provided for what, what is our yeah. purpose? So I do yeah. know that that can be hard dealing with that generational yes, it is. difference. Yeah. yeah. What, what generation are you? You're getting personal, Courtney. This I am. <laughs> I'm going to ask this question. You want to see yeah. my driver's license? Yeah. No, I'm, I didn't ask I'm your age. So. <laughs> okay. Let's just call me a boomer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, okay. So you're a boomer and, yeah. um, 
one of the things that you mentioned um, in, you know, on your website and a couple of things that you've written is the importance of older generations reaching down into yes. like millennials or even Gen Z. Gen Z is uh, those kids that are born from 1997 to 2012. That's what I'm talking about. So, yeah. 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 So they're, they're really, I mean, um, we're talking college, uh, just got out of college, that TikTok. type of <laughs> TikTok. Absolutely. I mean, I'm not even in TikTok though. I could be, but yeah, well, there you um, go. So. <laughs> so, you know, that generation, there are so many boomers, maybe even the silent generation that's above them that are like hands off. Like, I don't even know how to talk to them. I don't know what I would say, uh, how I would relate to them. Um, and yet that's what you're calling the church to do in your book is you're saying, no, 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 no. That's what we need to be doing. Like they are our future. So it's the harvest. It's the harvest. It's the harvest. So remember Jesus, the harvest is rich. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, yeah. So we're the laborers. <laughs> what is it that the older generations have to learn from the younger generations? Okay. Um, that's loaded too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, there's a lot in that. Um, one of the statistics that comes up, do you know Barna Research? Yes, Batman? absolutely. Okay. Well, that's who I use throughout my book. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, David Kinnaman is a great guy and, and yeah. is the head of that. Uh, but with that said, um, and you've probably heard this a million times before, but um, statistically, this generation is spiritual, but not religious. Yep. Are you there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hear it. So uh, help me with that is where I begin. Because mm-hmm. um, yours truly, me, a boomer, happens to be both. I'm both spiritual and I'm religious. Is that Okay. Mm-hmm. I, I I put a pause right there and ask, let them know who I am just to kind of get them to raise an eyebrow. Well, you know, so what? You're an old man. That does, you know, no big deal. So then let's talk about your spiritual life because, you know, I'm spiritual too. Mm-hmm. And tell me about your spirit and what spirits are at work in you. Mm. Yeah. Are you there? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you see, because there's a lot of spirits out there, Courtney. You know, now there may might be able to say, well, my dog is really close to me and he's my best friend. You know, oh, that's great. <laughs> you know, <laughs> good. you, you want to yeah, sort of elevate it a little bit from that conversation or, you know, the clouds are like spirit. Or when I go to the mountain or the beach, it's yeah. spiritual. Okay. Tell me what makes that spiritual? Well, the beach, well, what else? Mm-hmm. Where did the beach come from? <laughs> you know, let's start yeah. getting into the creation, you know, God, is where I'm going with this. Yeah. So anyways, yeah. it's that kind of conversation that really is sort of easy to have in one sense, but in another, it's complicated mm-hmm. and it's brand new. Um, I don't know if you know the phrase tabula rasa, but it's the blank slate board. I mean, they're, they're blackboard. That's old school, okay. but you know, okay. <laughs> there's nothing on it. So the, the advantage to this is that we get to sort of fill in some of the pieces that are really missing, like Holy mm. Spirit, what are you talking about? Mm. You know, well, or, let's talk or about it. those things that have gotten mixed in culture says them, but their definition of them is not what biblically we would believe. Yeah. And so yeah. people talk about it, or I love what you're saying. Like, I, I had a spiritual experience. Well, what does that mean to you? Yeah. And because I've had a spiritual experience at the top of a mountain too, but what I got sure, to I do have was, too. I have to, <laughs> yeah, it was look down and see God's creation. Tell me about Amen. your spiritual. I love yeah. that. What you're doing is instead of assuming that they are this way and I am this way and never the two shall meet. Right. Instead, right. you are building a bridge between Beautiful the bridge. two. Yes. yes. Important so bridge. Yes. So what is, what, why is it so important for younger generations to get involved to, to, okay. So if you do have an older generation that builds that bridge, why is it so important that that younger generation cross that bridge and, and, okay. you know, come into relationship with, people of an older generation? Well, um, I will start to say, because I keep looking at you and hearing you talk, you remind me of my daughter-in-laws. <laughs> my daughter-in-law, <laughs> yeah. my daughter-in-laws like me, Courtney. And, you know, that's a good they thing. laugh that's at my sign. jokes. Yeah. Now my sons, that's a different thing. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. 
but I love spending time with them. Uh, mm-hmm. They're conversational. They're really interested in what yeah. we're talking about. They are willing to go deep and, um, you know, share and some of the concerns that they have and all this sort of thing. And now back to your question. Um, and, and here again, I'm, I'm not getting political, but um, you, you know, uh, the category they're called the nuns. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're, they're not, it's not a religious order. It's those that circle none of the above. Oh, have you heard oh that no, before? I haven't heard that term. The demographics. We'll go back to, again, David Kinnaman and Barna. That's, he talks a great deal about it okay. from the standpoint. Um, I want to say 70, 60, 70% of the, this generation has circled none. That is when asked, are they Christian, Jewish, Islam, Buddhist, um, you know, mm. um, None, 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 none of those, mm. none, nada. All right, here's where I'm getting political. Go to Russia. <laughs> okay. What are you? Uh, Orthodox. Uh, if they're, if right? they're not Orthodox, they're none of the above. Um, oh, okay. Let me put it this way. So many of communism, co- communism, I, I don't know if you've ever been to East Germany. I have um, now East Germany and West Germany, of course, are united. And I'm talking way out of school here, but so many, it's like North and South, okay. um, you know, pe- after the civil war, so many of them just will not talk because mm-hmm. of, you know, the, again, the difference that comes with being under communism and having no religion, none of the above, none of the above. Okay. Okay, so that's where I'm going with that. And that's why I say I don't necessarily want to get political, but it's scary, scary to me when, you know, the media will play it up. It's, oh, look, they're all leaving religion. Isn't that great? They've all abandoned religion and so on and so forth. It's scary. And I, again, I'm going to say it's a cry for help because Mm. these, I don't want to say kids, but these young people just right now are at a point where it's dangerous for them to not have a power greater than themselves. Yeah. You might say this in a recovery program or something, you know, I mean, that's their first step, isn't it? Is to, all right. So you get where yeah. I'm going with this. Yeah. Yeah. And that By idea. The way, did you notice a little passion in that? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> I, no one around here ever gets passionate about what they're okay. saying. Uh, it's, no it's one. the real deal. It's the real deal we're playing <laughs> yeah. with. Yeah. 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 Well, and I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And and I've had many conversations with um, people my age as a millennial about whether or not their uh, religion or their belief in Christ uh, comes into play when they're making decisions about um, ev- really every area of life. Sure, politics is one, but um, sure. how they school their children or um, yes. how they how they do their taxes or how they run their businesses. Um, it, it's like yeah. every area of life, uh, does it affect that or yes. does it not? And, and I think we go back to the very beginning uh, of our conversation where we were talking about spiritual growth. All growth and life needs to come out of that relationship with Jesus Christ. And so to say, well, this is Jesus and he's over here, but he doesn't touch every other part of my life. There is going to come a point in time where there is going to be turmoil with inside of you because you're like, this part of me knows this is wrong, but I have set up this other part of me as like, Jesus doesn't touch that part. And now the two in my life are, are warring against each other. And I don't, I don't know what to do. I'm you got unsure. It. You got yeah. it. Yeah. So that, so that the nuns, what do we, <laughs> that I, I thought, <laughs> so you're talking N O N E. Yeah. Those nuns. What, what can we learn from scripture and from James about the importance of maybe if, if that's some, if that's us, if we're see, circling none, uh, why do you think it's important for us to maybe read find, James? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. So read no, James, no. why is it important? I, did, I didn't mean to finish your sentence. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but uh, you, you've, again, I, you've, you've pushed a million buttons. Yes, I do that. With yes. me. Thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, um, first of all, who's James, you know, and I think mm-hmm. that's a fascinating discussion in and of itself from the standpoint of whether or not he is a biological brother of Jesus or a stepbrother of Jesus or a cousin of Jesus, you know, you get all the academic arguments I call him a living link. I mean, he's oh. alive. By the way, his letter 
Now, scholars are saying came out probably in the 40s, early 40s, okay. before Paul's letters. Okay. As okay. in one of the earliest letters. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking. I mean, it's and really- someone that's, who lived with Jesus. By the Lit way, walk and talk Jesus. with Jesus. Yeah. yeah, let's go to yeah. Cana, to the wedding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you mean he changed water into wine? How did he do that? You know, so mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it, it, here we go. We have back to passion. I mean, it gets my heart pounding because he's right next to Je uh, Jesus and whether or not he was with Jesus when uh, the Sermon on the Mount took place or whether the Sermon on the Mount uh, comes from, um, you know, a collection of sayings that, you know, there's all kinds of ac academic stuff. I say fully from that standpoint. Go to James and oh, people will say James doesn't use the word Jesus that much in his letter. Martin Luther mm -hmm. back in the Reformation, you know, would be one who just threw James out because there wasn't enough of Jesus in it. Mm -hmm. Read James and what we find is dripping with the Sermon on the Mount, uh, the comparisons uh, yeah. with the Sermon. I mean, he was there. He had to be. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, all right. With that said, um, uh, your question again is what would young uh, people so, get? Oh, I know. Yeah, Here, I know, I know none, the answer. Why? Yeah, I know <laughs> the answer. Pick me, pick me. <laughs> but yeah, uh, doing the word. Let's do the word. Mm. That's James. Uh, be doers of the word. Yeah. Well, that, that back to excitement and passion and where these young people are, you got them. Uh, mm. They don't want to hear the word or just talk. Um, you know, they, they want to do it. And when, when I said earlier, they're, they're into restoration and making a difference in ways that uh, bring about change that they can see right before their eyes. Okay, let's go. Mm -hmm. um, I could talk again, what got me started in writing this book in the first place goes all the way back to my first assignment at, mm -hmm. at a cathedral in downtown Memphis, where wow. I was at the, um, at the altar and on it was a Latin inscription that said, Alleluia, uh, Hosanna, which meant praise the Lord. And I asked the person at one point when I had the guts to ask someone a question, <laughs> you know, all these holy people walking around, you know, what is that all about? And they said it was Mother Constance. Now, she was a nun. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Mother Constance, she, they came down from New York. Uh, this order, it was an Anglican order. They came from New York to Memphis to minister to the people in Memphis in 1876, if you're still mm. with me. Wow. Okay. During the yellow fever. Wow. Okay. Courtney, wow. we're talking COVID. Yeah. They're yeah. talking yellow fever. Mm -hmm. By the way, Osana, uh, Alleluia, were her last words. Praise the Lord. Wow. Wow. And she did the word. And mm -hmm. I, I, so that planted the word in this boy's heart trust me mm. you know because there i am kneeling and thinking about her every time i was there, i thought oh my goodness now my question is because you're talking about okay so i think what you touched on right there is that when we're talking about discipleship and the people that we want to disciple us it's usually someone who is acting out scripture because you you look uh -huh. at them and you're like wow, you, your marriage is really strong or your parenting is something that I would love to emulate because you do it with such love and such grace. And they're probably yes. inside going, no, I don't, but okay. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. And, if, you, if you say so, yeah, yeah. if you say so, uh, but we're seeing Jesus lived out in their lives and that is attractive to us. And we want to be able to do the same. Uh, what does it take to, uh, that's my opinion on if, if someone's sure. like, how do I find a disciple? I'm like, find someone that is loving Jesus and living out Jesus and, and ask them to be a part of your life. But if Absolutely. for someone who maybe is asked to be a mentor, what does it take to be a discipler, to be a mentor? We're starting a training, a training program for mentors. And mm. uh, that again, spins off, not just of this book, but of, of a, a national program called the fellows initiative that I, we could talk about. And in fact, you'll see it at the, in the book, the, the, uh, president of it, the executive di director endorsed the book. So my mm -hmm. book, which was a way of, again, saying, let's go forward with all of this. I mean, it's, it's so exciting. Uh, yeah. But to your answer, your question, um, you're looking for, for people that, um, A, are mature, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, that, that, and so that's a, um, it's not subjective, but it's something that needs, again, discernment and 
why would you call this person mature and this person not mature? You know, you want to be careful with all this. And, you know, transparency is such a big word these days. Everyone needs to be transparent, all that kind of stuff. Well, no one's transparent when it comes to, <laughs> I mean, you know, we're all sort of back to vulnerable. You know, we kind of cover ourselves up and mm -hmm. I'm not really sure why this person's talking to me. And so set it within a casual, uh, informal context of, of conversation and discussion and the need. Oh, I like that. Lay it out. Yeah, lay it out in terms of what is necessary. This, what I call a cry for help. And are you willing? And, you know, they probably either have grandkids this age or they've got kids this age, you know. So sure, you know, you're, you're already getting them hooked from that standpoint, but then also to look at some of the, the characteristics and you've talked about it as far as being a person of faith, obviously. Um, of, of in Christ and you begin to see that credibility in their in their participation in the life of the church and and you know when I talk about doing the word let's have just a sense of who James is or what the Bible's about or um, you know God yeah. so loved the world <laughs> he gave yeah. us only begotten son. Can you quote me a verse? You know, no, a seriously, verse. you got to remember who we're talking to, Courtney. You know, so, you really want to start with a, a understanding, seriously, of scripture. Yeah. That, 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 and, and then we'll talk them, we, we will work with the mentors through scripture so we can talk about sin uh, and creation, uh, but also redemption and, and words like that that, mm. you know, roll off my tongue. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's not necessarily part of the vocabulary of a lot of mentors, you know, yeah. off the bat. So what I hear you saying is that when you look at who's qualified to be a mentor, it is not someone who, uh, it is not only pastors. It is not only no, someone no, who's no. gone to seminary. You're using things like they have life experience. They're more mature yes. than the people that they're looking to mentor. They yeah, are, um, yes looking, they themselves are continuing to grow in their own relationship with Christ, uh, continuing yes. to memorize scripture, continuing to live out scripture. That is what makes yes. a person uh, prepared and ready to disciple, not some kind of, well, all disciples must go to seminary or go through, you know, this no particular training program, probably any training program you can put yourself through is going to help you be a better discipler. But what I hear you saying is that that's, that's like a, that's like something you're going to use to help. That's not what qualifies you to be a disciple. Right. And or, also yeah. I would add to this because again, you're a good conversationalist. You are. Thank you. Uh, and well, you're welcome. <laughs> but, but here again, this is, this is a, a kind of a requirement, uh, it, it, but included in conversation is listening. Yeah. As well as asking questions. So, mm -hmm. you know, you get that kind of person, but then we have, um, and probably most church, many of your churches have small groups and yeah. you've got small group leaders. Mm -hmm. There they are. Those yeah. are the mentors. Uh, yeah. But you don't want to snag them <laughs> from other, you know, leaders or other groups or other uh, uh, areas of the church. But in the event that they're available. <laughs> After you've talked to them and paid them money, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Will you come over to ours? You know, but oh, that right. this is oh, but you know, you get the pastor and all of all the leadership on board that this is what we're starting to launch, and we're going to need your help. And would you be willing to identify some of the people that you might consider? You know, all this kind of thing. Yeah. But you yep. keep saying, you know, so it's not the pastor's job, and I'm not being defensive here, but. Think of uh, this again. The statistics. Uh, I want to say 98, 99. At least in the Episcopal Church, 98, 99 percent of the people are lay people in the church. They're not mm -hmm. ordained. Mm -hmm. uh, they're mm -hmm. not ministers. Okay, yeah. so that leaves you with one percent <laughs> that's that would be qualified. No, you yeah. know, you've got to spread this puppy out and get it. You know, make it a a, a broad base of yeah. min ministry and mission. I'll use that word mission. Yeah. Well, and in my opinion, uh, scripture doesn't even confirm that it's just the pastor. You know, the pastor, obviously he's a shepherd uh, and that is going to be part of his job is uh, helping people uh, in their issues and, and walking people through things, maybe even doing some uh, marriage counseling or whatever it might sure. look like. But Matthew 28 is for 
everyone. Yes. It's a command for go ye, go everyone. Ye. Yeah. That's right. And yeah. make disciples. And then when we see Second Timothy two two, now we're looking at go and tell the people, tell tell others what you've heard from me, uh, in the in the presence of many witnesses go and tell uh, faithful men so that they can go and tell others so this yeah. is not like go and tell other people make sure that they're pastors and then go and make more pastors and make no this is saying disciples are everyone anyone yeah. this is a yeah. command yeah. for everyone and so i think it's important to remember and maybe that's easier actually for a younger generation to understand you said we're spiritual but not religious Right. And so it's actually easier, I think, for the, the younger generation to understand that this is something that um, can happen anywhere. The church, obviously, is the foundation, and that's a great place to start. Uh, sure. But this is a call for all people, not just uh, the super spiritual or the super religious or anything. This is, this is a spiritual thing, not a religious well, thing. Sure. And, and, and again, not to just quote Latin to you, but the word religion means to bind together. Mm -hmm. And so religiaro. So what, what we're doing when we say we're both religious and spiritual is religion ties your spirit or holds your spiritual life mm -hmm. together, you know, and without it, that spiritual life can go all over the place. And that's, that's, right. that's the danger of just being spiritual. I guess I didn't finish that sentence back whenever no, that but was that's... we were talking about, but yeah. But it's important for these young people to know that religion isn't just artificial. It isn't just institutional, you know, the kinds mm -hmm. of words that get thrown at us. We're not just hypocritical. We're, you know, on and on and it goes. But, yeah. but let's let's talk about the importance of integrating the two. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for like all of this discussion and all of this information. Where can we find you? Where can we find information on your books? Uh, do you have anything uh, for listeners that can kind of help them process through some of the things we've been talking about today? Oh, thanks for asking, uh, Courtney. I, Robin, R-O-B-I-N-T is in Tom Jennings, J-E-N-N-I-N-G-S dot com. And then backslash Guided Reflection mm. is where they get a download of a 50-page journal that I put together. And I could talk all oh. day about journaling and the importance of journaling. But it's a uh -huh. way, again, of spiritual reflection by yourself, by, by journaling. But in it are these different categories, which uh, all relate to the different books. The first book was on that I wrote was on Peter, but the importance of vision uh, in spiritual mm. growth. Uh, the, and... Well, I can't, won't talk about each book, but the second book was Paul and the Renewal of the Mind. And so that's, uh, again, uh, the, the whole aspect of that second section of the journal. The third section is James and Bearing Witness, mm -hmm. uh, which is, again, an important aspect of spiritual growth is don't just <laughs> talk about it, do it, you know. So yeah. anyways, and, the, and then the fourth book is Becoming a Mentor. To the next generation mm -hmm. and so okay. you, you'll find all that in a download on robintjennings.com backslash guided reflection um we have one question that we finish uh every episode with i thought you were going to invite me out for dinner or something i thought we were just getting if started if you are in phoenix text me and we will okay. go and get dinner absolutely okay. right. <laughs> you can come on over you can meet my boys and uh okay. my husband and we'll talk it's dinner time hours. here in louisville Courtney. it's dinner there, time here that's why I said. You <laughs> you're like i am hungry let's get this done. uh so you got one more question hot chicken is that that's a thing there yeah. right okay <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so none of us, uh, you and I have talked about today, why it's important to be in community and why it's important to be living life with other people. So who is it that has helped you along in your journey? Um, I, I oh, would not want to limit it to yeah. one person. Mm -hmm. Remember, I'm, I'm mature. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a boomer. I've been around. I, there's so many, but, yeah. but that's, that, that, you know, think of your life and who's been important in your life, the mentors in your life, you know, it's a string it is. and it depends back when we were talking renewal, depending on the season of that, of my life, that person came in at the right time and the right place that said, Hey, do you want to go out for dinner? Do you want to go out for lunch? Uh, how about a cup of coffee? Mm -hmm. You know, that was just the right time for the right person and the right conversation. But then uh, there have been like the Dallas Willards and the Giants in terms of the, the books uh, have been mentors to me indirectly, 
But yeah. at the same time, I've been able to take it and run with the material and with the information that that has helped back with the formation of my life. But I, I could know I could go back to my third grade uh, <laughs> teacher or my. <laughs> but what a but, blessing but you don't if that's want true. That. <laughs> But no, or, uh, you know, seriously, a basketball coach, a, a football mm -hmm. coach. I mean, I had so many people that, that came into my life and intervened mm -hmm. uh, at a time and a point and a place where I really needed someone to not clean my clock, but to turn my head around and say, what are you thinking? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Where are you going? You know, it was a little rough and tough before ministry and before we met, you know, <laughs> the good people but but you know you, you there there are those that really came into my life like the chaplain at the the boys home who said you ask good questions that's all he said to me mm. that changed my life um yeah. the the remember the guy i met in the small group who said to me um you know you're not surrendering to the enemy robin Mm. what <laughs> and it sounds so, to me like you know, it, it's so much of it is just them affirming things that they see in you you ask good questions and you know like yes. maybe you know you're doing a good job but maybe you need to think about surrender as this and uh giving you a different perspective on life and that's why it's so important to have other people you know with more wisdom and more life experience looking yeah. in on our lives and saying maybe your perspective is wrong or maybe yes. have you ever yes. thought about how good you are at this and you're like yes. well i just thought i i mean yes i never thought that was special about me but you know people used to just tell me i talk too much now you're telling me that i make good questions great <laughs> <You know? laughs> well so. and here again you talk about different times and different seasons and you were saying you were a baptist uh, did you know the louisville uh, baptist southern seminary is in louisville Oh, the Baptist okay. Seminary, the, the big one, the Gazunda, you know, uh -huh. a bunch of those guys are friends of mine, the professors there. Mm, I, yes. I did a lot of Bible study at our church, which was kind of good and new and different for the church, but uh, big classes. And by the way, the, the class on James is one of the reasons why I wrote the book. It took mm. off and okay. it wasn't me. It was the word That's right. That's <laughs> and right. doing the word. Well, anyways, That's I know right. you're wrapping this up, but with, with this said, um, one of these professors I was talking, and this was actually my second book. Uh, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. I was doing a teaching on Paul, doing something, I can't remember what, but I, we, we were talking over coffee. I said, I don't get it. And he said, what do you mean? You don't know what it means to be transforming. And I said, no, what does it mean not, not to be conformed to this world? What other world is there? Mm. <laughs> oh, wow. Courtney, that's my humor again, sort of at work, because he almost said, you know, pass the salt please or the ketchup or something you know whatever we're doing because he, he he couldn't believe it. he says robin the kingdom of god yeah mm. and went what oh my goodness do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind well, you know here we go now we're entering into the kingdom of god in a way that this world yeah it's not the it's not the end game it's not what it's all about that's right that's right and when How we think that? of it that way I, yeah I, I think it's that's when we think of it that way, it affects the way that we live our everyday life. It yeah. affects uh, the decisions we make. And because when we're thinking about the kingdom of God. Um, oh, my goodness. Yeah. It, it, I thought it meant to be a nonconformist, you know, and I no smoke, no drink. I can't dance, you know, oh, with you know how these Baptists are. Courtney. Oh, people have used it for that. <laughs> yes. Yes. No, I'm kidding. You. But with all this said, you know, I, I didn't know where you he forgot. Was you go. forgot cards. You right. forgot. No, yeah. no poker. No, yeah. no, yeah. I didn't know where he was going. And then it's just with one sentence. And that's what I mean by mentors. Yeah. It's these people that say the right thing at the right time in the right place. And boom, you know, that's right. That's right. Well, and, and I'll leave you on this one conversations. Yeah. Watch out for conversations. They lead to conversion. Did you know that? Mm. Conversion is a word embedded in the word conversation. So that's right. Have some good conversations with these young people and see where it takes them. Wow. And that, and that takes that, that takes the time to, and willingness to sit down and just get to know them and just have yes. those conversations. And from there, yeah. I think that's the hard thing. We, we are always scared of the unknown. And so, yes, when we don't know these kids or students or, or whoever it is, yeah. uh, this person younger than you, if you don't know them, yes, of course they're scary and it's hard to think about it, but uh, about what, how you would come about it. But when you sit down and you talk to them and you get to know them, it becomes very obvious. Yeah. 
yeah. how God is working in their life, uh, what strongholds the enemy has, and in what yes. ways can you speak wisdom and truth into their life? I don't, I don't, it is not a big mystery in my opinion, but just a little bit of conversation opens up doors and sheds light, a lot of light on the situation and makes it not so scary. So yes. Yes. Well, thank you so much, (laughs) Reverend Jennings. We really appreciate you (laughs) being here to talk with us. And uh, yes, if you're in Phoenix, I invite you over to have dinner at my house. (laughs) We'll make it happen. (laughs) Sorry. Okay. (laughs) All right. Have a wonderful day. 